in studio with the Admiral Bill Stubblefield and New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap, also known as Bill and Gill. Good morning, gentlemen. Oh, did you notice that, I John? just lost top uh, yeah, billing. Yeah, just lost top billing. That's why it's Man. Getting, yeah, if you'd been nicer to Rob when you first walked in, well, you still true. have top billing. Yeah. Well, keep in mind that uh, the word billing, as in top billing, starts with a bill, not a gill. So <laughs> top gilling it would have been the case, then you'd be number one. But it's you are number one in so many regards, John. <laughs> This uh, segment also brought to you by Ameriprise Financial and the Marius Group of Financial Advisors, John Everson and Phil McCoy on Winchester Avenue, Martinsburg. And that's where you'll find our next guest, Mr. Financial Phil. Phil McCoy, good morning, sir. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Phil, let's start first with the, with the just the shroud of doom and gloom has been lifted in Steeler Nation. Matt Canada fired that actually looked like an NFL offense yesterday. It's the first time we've seen an offense in Pittsburgh since 2019. And although they only put up 16 points, they controlled the game from start to finish. They moved the ball. They got first down. uh, One time of possession, every offensive category. I was ecstatic with their offensive play. It's the first time I've seen offense in the black and gold in, in a long time. Hopefully they can keep that up. But threw the ball to the tight end, used the middle of the field. Uh, Najee Harris looked good. It, it was just a good day altogether, except for uh, Deontay Johnson refusing to pick up a fumble or a block on, on, a, on a play. Uh, hopefully he hears it over, over for this week over that. But that was a, a big win, and 7-4, and four, looking, at, looking at probable playoffs if they keep winning. And they're still in the AFC North race, so it's a good, good weekend to be a Steeler fan. I'm happy – Took all that bad taste out of her mouth from losing to the Brownies. That may have been the best thing that's ever happened. To and is there any truth, Phil, that they were still using Matt Campbell's playbook yesterday? Canada, not Canada. Canada, uh, Canada. Z- <laughs> zero, zero proof. <laughs> zero proof. There was no resemblance of Matt Canada at all in Cincinnati yesterday, and that's why I say that loss to Cleveland may have been the best thing that's happened to us in uh, in the last three or four years. They broke their streak of not having gained 400 yards in 58 games. And surprisingly, Phil, they showed that graphic on the TV yesterday. They were 34-23-1 in the 58 games where their offense wasn't working. <laughs> yeah, I, I, so they I won 34-58 no games without an offense. <laughs> That's a key component to winning. Gilstrap, who's a huge NFL fan and he's becoming a giant Steeler fan, uh, just because of these segments that we do, came in today and said that just looked a lot better than it's ever looked before. Or... It did. It, it didn't really show up on the scoreboard, but they had a touchdown that they should have challenged yeah. uh, that would have given up another touchdown. First but, thing know, John said when he way, came in. Yeah, and the way that the Steelers play, though, when they got they kind of got the lead and they would get with it in field goal range and, and shut it down just to be conservative. So, you know, the 16 points, here's the best I can say. They scored, the offense scored 16 points. In the past, if they had scored 16 points, you could guarantee that there was a fumble recovery for a touchdown or or an interception for a touchdown. The offense scored 16 points. And most importantly, the defense got a turnover, and the offense did something with it. And that's got to be a huge boost to those guys. You know, those those guys work hard, and they need a break, and they got a turnover. And the Steelers scored. I was like, "Wow, what, what's going on here?" There's no, there wasn't a three and out. It was just, it was a good day, good day. Yep. And uh, Phil, also uh, from, from a football perspective, you have uh, West Virginia winning eight games this year for the first time, I think, in like in nine years, or, or or they can get to nine wins for the first time in like nine years. And then on the high school front, Martinsburg's going back to Wheeling Island Stadium to play Princeton, which beat Bridgeport seventy-three to seventy. In the other semifinal game, I, I sent that score out to the coach's string that I'm on with our own team here in, uh, at Oakdale, and everyone thought it was a basketball score. I said, no, that's that's the other semifinal football score, 73-70? to 70? Yeah, that was surprising. And I did get to watch uh, Martinsburg. I was excited for that game and thinking that maybe it would be competitive. But, boy, but Martinsburg looked good, and they ran the ball. You know, I, was, I, I thought. I was like, well, Huntington seems to they, – they throw the ball, it seems, anyway, fairly well, and Martinsburg's run heavy. I wonder if they just gear up and stop Martinsburg's run game. And they couldn't do it, and that defense stepped up. Huntington's got a stud offensive lineman that looks to be going to some major Division One program. I think he's number 73. and But they, they kept him out. He plays defense, too. They kept him out of the backfield. He didn't wreck the game. 
and uh, the Martinsburg's defense, which I think is a strong suit. Their defense looked really good, so that was that was kind of fun to watch. And it looks like Martinsburg of old is back. So I hope they, I hope they, I'm pretty sure anyway that they should be heavy favorites over Princeton. But uh, of course, you, you always got to play the game. I thought maybe J.R. House came out of retirement and had suited up in his old Nitro uniform. Remember those old Nitro scores when J.R. House was there? Phil, there was, every yeah. game was like 59 to 52. Yes, and that was yeah. kind of because in Bridgeport's kind of a, a, a slow offense, and I don't want to say slow, but they run the ball a lot. I was surprised at that score. Me too. But uh, Phil, Rob's team did pretty good as well. So they're in. Uh, I heard. For, I asked yeah. him. So they're yeah. off to the state championship, right? Yeah. Um, on Saturday, Martinsburg, I think, plays at noon at Wheeling Island Stadium. And uh, we'll be playing at 7 o'clock at uh, uh, Navy Marine Corps Stadium on the, the campus of uh, the Naval Academy. That's pretty cool. Uh, that's Winners a, all around. So best of luck to you, sir. If you haven't been to a game at Navy Stadium, I recommend you go. It's just a amazing experience the stadium itself and everything involved with it is just amazing yeah. now you're playing who linganor high school and they're how far from oakdale seven miles so <laughs> you go seven miles away you go to annapolis to play for the championship yeah i, I think fort, well, hill, fort hill plays mountain ridge yeah. and they they have to drive all the way from western maryland to navy stadium yeah. and they'll you know, they'll pass each other's school on the way there you know just a couple and miles away where betting is legal where betting is legal, do people bet on high school football games? They shouldn't. I no, they shouldn't. But is it legal? I, they... Not that I know of. I okay. mean, I, I imagine you can if you want to. I, I, think... I don't. I don't mean like you know two guys getting together over over beer. I mean like like on the sports like an official line on a yeah, high school the sports game? book. Dylan, I think ends up. I think he he has looked up high school point spreads. I think someone publishes high school point spreads. Dylan, you got your ears on. You can jump in here if you want to. But I don't. I never look for them, so I don't know, Dylan. Oh, wait, hold on. There you go. I had the wrong <laughs> pot up. Go ahead, Dylan. There you go. Uh, I, I've never seen, like, one of the official sports books, like a FanDuel or DraftKings, that'll have anything other than, like, Division One college, so you probably couldn't even bet on Shepard on there. But I, I, I see all the time there will be things online. People will be, like, put unofficial sports, you know, spreads, be like a projection of, oh, Martinsburg should win this game by 14, or, you know, stuff like that. But I don't know if there's anything out there where you could – you know, bet online on an official sports book or anything like that. I would hope that there isn't anything out there that allows you to buy, bet on high school football. You, you got to be a pretty degenerate kind of person to <laughs> be betting on high school football, right? You know, I mean, it's it's people it's, bet on everything. But it, it's one thing if, like, if you if you went to Martinsburg and somebody else went to Princeton and it's your buddy and you call, hey, I'll bet you five bucks, you know, Martinsburg wins or Princeton wins. That's Different, but if you're going, if you're trying to look for like a legal betting app for a high school game, man, it, you need therapy or something. Right. <laughs> it's high school football. Come on. Uh, anyway, Phil. Speaking of uh, betting money, let's talk about the stock market. Which uh, this morning uh, futures markets are slightly lower, not much, but uh, slightly. It's been a pretty great November. What's driving the market in regards to this uh, late year rally, and what could throw it off? No, uh, the what has been driving it is the economy is slowing and inflation. The the readings that we've gotten anyway, the CPI and the PPI were a little bit lower than expected, and and this week we get the PCE, which is assumed to be the Federal Reserve's preferred measure. However, after the consumer price index and the producer price index, I think we have a pretty good grasp on what the PCE should be. That's why the CPI gets so much information but that or get so much attention but the the economic reports the jobs numbers have slowed down the wage numbers have slowed down and that's what the federal reserve is trying to do and to the question that you ask i think the the most important thing this year and can our markets sustain this run that we've been on in november and exceed the highs that we reached in the summer around august or early august in the summer on the s p and and the NASDAQ is what does the holiday season look like? And it's always a really important time. And most often we say, hey, we want a Santa Claus rally. We want people to go out and show that consumer strength and be willing to spend a bunch of money uh, throughout the holidays, whether it's on gifts or travel or whatever it may be. We want that typically. This year I think what we would like to see is a Grinch rally. 
And, and by that, I mean we kind of hold on to our purse strings a little bit tighter, show that that consumer confidence has dropped a little bit more, and show that the, the, uh, what the Federal Reserve has done in order to slow the consumer, and that's what they're trying to do, slow the consumer, and that proof will be in the pudding over the holiday season, and we'll get tidbits of information leading up to Christmas and afterward with, with the Cyber Mondays and the Black Fridays and all the special shopping days that we have. There will be pieces of retail information that tells us how strong that consumer is and how much they're willing to spend. But this year, in the face of inflation, I don't think we want a Santa Claus rally. We still may call it that. If, it's a, if our markets get a boost in, in, in December, we'll still call it a Santa Claus rally. But in actuality, what it would be is a Grinch rally. We, we need people to hang on to those purse, purse strings a little bit during the holiday season. It's almost like there's a, a narrow bandwidth of what's an acceptable am- amount of uh, retailer profit and consumer spending right now, Phil. Too much, and You're we exactly. start to fear about inflation again. Yes, we've been walking a tightrope ever since we started battling inflation. Because, and, and even still, we'll, we'll still this narrative will pop up as the economy starts to slow, and that re- recession talk has went away a little bit. But as the economy starts to slow and steepens with future reports, especially if we do get a Grinch rally, that recession talk will re-enter, and we'll start talking about are we going to go into a recession, and and then it will flip eventually. It will flip, and that will be a good thing. Eventually the narrative is going to flip, and it's uh, jobs or or we're losing jobs at at a fast pace, and the consumers aren't willing to spend but that's where the Federal Reserve increasing rates, they've got, they've got a bullet and they've got a, a secret weapon, not really secret, but decreasing rates is on the horizon. So the, the worse these reports look and the slower the economy gets, assuming inflation comes down with it and gets to that targeted 2% that, that uh, John Gilstrap and I both agree, I wish they would just come off of that a little bit. But that's when the Federal Reserve, even if, and this is, this is going to be interesting, even if, because we have to remember when they increase or decrease rates, it's not immediate impact. It takes about six months for that to work its way through the economy. So we could get to inflation, say, of 2.5%, and then the Federal Reserve still willing to begin to cut rates. That's when our markets will really, really rally. And then the discussion will be, and we, and we had it in 2023 earlier in the year, but that that's when that discussion will uh, start to resurface. Are we going to go into a recession? Of course, half the people will think we are, and the other half will think that we're not. And if we do go into a recession, we're nowhere near that talk yet, but if we do go into a recession, how long is it likely to last? And that will be the next narrative. But before that comes into play, our economy has to continue to slow, which right now has been good for the stock market. Phil, last week you were not on, so I did not have the guidance of Phil McCoy, and I became convinced the market was responding to the butterfly effect. And so some butterfly waving its wings in Tokyo was driving a market up and down. And so, uh, But you're giving me some reason today to think there is a rhyme and reason to the market. It's just trying to decipher what these are I find to be exceptionally confusing. Yes, and it is confusing right now, but at the end of the day, we really want to look at every event and what happens and what is its impact on inflation, which would give us some insight to what the Federal Reserve would likely do. And over the last, since 2022, when our markets really had a bad year, it was all in in, in response to the Federal Reserve increasing rates at the three-quarters of a percent. It was really, really steep. And this year, because that has paused, it has slowed down. Uh, It slowed down earlier in the year, and then it was a complete pause. And the economic reports, CPI, PPI, jobs reports, have started to slow, which is why we've had a pretty good year. And that is confusing because if we remove the narrative of we're battling inflation, those are all bad things. If we're not battling inflation, we want a strong consumer. We want a consumer willing to spend We want all of those things. But if we're trying to battle inflation, a consumer willing to spend money, willing to borrow money, that is an inflationary pressure, which could cause the Federal Reserve 
to either keep rates higher longer or continue to increase rates, which still isn't off the table. Uh, that's why I say that it's, it's a crucial point this last part of the year, how much money does people spend, because if we spend it, it's going to support inflation. If, and if inflation is still supported, the only way to slow it down is to increase rates yet again, and that would be bad for the market. So that that is we're in the topsy-turvy world, and we'll be there for a while until the Federal Reserve starts to cut rates. We will be there for a while. That, that will probably, in my estimation anyway, will still be the narrative all the way through 2024 is how strong is this consumer, how willing is this consumer uh, to spend money, and a lot of that is on the jobs. You know, we talk about jobs a lot and, the, and what our employment look like, but we know if Americans and people around the world, even if they're working and they're making more money, they're more likely to spend that money. And if they spend that money, inflation is supported, and the only way to slow it down is for Jerome Powell to increase rates. We're hoping that, that has reached a tipping point, is on its way down, and they're finished increasing rates. And now the overall question is, when could they begin to cut rates? And that will be still answered by what the, the inflation numbers look like, what's the job report look like, and what's consumer confidence look like, which is why the holiday season is so very important to see is their consumer slowing down a little bit. There's no better time to find that out than during the holiday season. Meanwhile, in the rest of the world, um, the Chinese economy, a lot of articles in the Wall Street Journal that are sort of doom and gloom on the the Chinese economy not doing so well. I've heard the EU economy, the, the EU nations' economies are not doing all that well. How big uh, Grinch can these factors be on our economy, even if we do everything right and we get our soft landing? Uh, and, and ultimately, that could be a good thing for them, too, depending on where they are in the battle with inflation. But their economy slowing down could help us as well. And if their economy is slowing down and they're producing um, at a lower cost because of inflation dropping, that would be good for us as well. But right now, uh, our our overall outlook on our markets is is narrowly focused on what's going on in our country. The only thing that we have looked at, and this has been really since COVID, when we look at other economies, and if you look think back to to the COVID numbers, we would look at another economy or another country and look at their COVID numbers and then portray that over to us and what has it done to their economy, and we would portray that over to us as well. And that is that is what we're looking at right now with other economies is how did their inflation slow and wonder if we're going to be on that same path. But it, it, we are very narrowly focused right now on our economy and what our inflation numbers look like. So very little has spilled over to the, uh, to us here in this country. But if you have large amounts of, of international exposure in your portfolio, that's where you would see it. You would see it on an overall basis in your portfolio if you have – a lot of international exposure, especially on the equity side. Financial. Phil McCoy, our guest here on the program from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad Group of Financial Advisors. Did you have a follow-up, Mr. Gilstrap? Well, I just want to make sure we're talking the same thing and not conflating economies with markets. markets. So if, if as, as economies slow, that means that more people are, are out of work and what have you. And if that's what's happening in China, for example – that means fewer goods. The fewer goods means lower manufacturing here or higher manufacturing costs here, depending. So I guess how separating the markets from economies, what do we see in the next year to five years in terms of the net effect of all of this on the actual, the, the economies? Uh, well, let's stick with the United States. The net effect, I mean, the net effect is it's going to slow. And and that's what we were go back to what we were talking about before, and I hope I'm answering this question correctly or I'm on the right path. But we're looking for our economy to slow without going into a recession. And if we do go into a recession, how long do we stay there? And the Federal Reserve's ability to catch us before we go into a recession by cutting rates and propping our economy back up. But, you know, as far as internationally, it does have very little impact on what the Federal Reserve is doing and on what our overall inflation looks like, with the exception of oil, the price of oil, but it has very little uh, impact on what our economy looks like at the moment. Now, at the, if we rewind back about a year and a half with the chip manufacturers, that was a big issue because it really slowed production 
and it slowed supply, which was part of that math equation that made our inflation go up to over 9%, uh, although for a, little, for a little while, but it did go up over 9%. That was part of that equation with the automobiles and not being able to get the chips. And I remember talking about how they were producing automobiles without certain features that used to be there because they didn't have the chips for it and et cetera. But with the exception of oil and even with the other economies slowing, it should have very little to no impact on our, on our economy. Hold on there, Bill. Let me yeah, bring sure. your mic up there. Okay. okay. Uh, Phil, we've been looking forward from John's question. Let's take a look backward. Uh, you've been very critical or have been critical over the past year or so of uh, some of the comments of the chairman of the Federal Reserve and felt that that has been driving us one way or the other. In hindsight, uh, do you think that the Federal Reserve gets receives passing uh, passing grades for the course of action they've taken for the last two years? Phil, let me answer first. <clears throat> the answer is no. There was a war on the economy declared by Chairman Powell. <laughs> Phil agrees with me 100 percent, and they've wrecked the American economy. You th- I think that echoes your thoughts, Phil. I've been one of the very few. Uh, I've been very apologetic for the Federal Reserve. Uh, because with their stance and why the, the whole transitory uh, tone that they took, that did ultimately they were wrong. And but I understand where they were coming from when that. So Rob has been very critical of the Federal Reserve. I have, on the other hand, I have. I want a piece of that too. Supportive. I have been very critical of the Federal Reserve. <laughs> Phil's been, been namby pamby. <laughs> I have been very supportive of the Federal Reserve because I knew. When those rates came down in April of 2020 and our markets took off, I knew that there would be, there would be some, some hell to pay, if you will, in, in our markets eventually, that that would have to be retracted some because I knew that they would have to cut rates. And with the amount of money, and it wasn't just the Federal Reserve, but it was the amount of money that we received, whether it's through PPP from businesses or the stimulus checks that people had got, in conjunction with while we were stuck at home, we saved money. And when people save money, we know as consumers that eventually overall they'll spend it. So I have been very apologetic of, or supportive of the Federal Reserve because I don't think that game is over yet. I think we're still in the third quarter. Now, if we go into a crashing recession that lasts for years, then, yeah, then I, I will jump on board with Rob and John with how, how terrible the Federal Reserve is. But to this point, I understand why they did what they did, and I think they've been transparent. Now, I was critical in, in April of 22, or not April, but August of 2022 20, when he sternly said our economy, uh, our, our, there's going to be pain in our economy. I didn't think that was necessary for him to say that. But, the, but overall, I think the path at what they have done, I understand why they've done it. And to this point, I would give them passing marks. If you look at our – economy and our stock market since the beginning of COVID, I think overall both of them have done an incredible job of sustaining what we had gone through. And we're still in this post-COVID economy and post-COVID markets to where the, the, the final results haven't been seen yet, but I do think we're winning that war. And no, no better example than that than in November, while our overall economy, while it has slowed, still looks pretty good. Our stock market is so much higher than what it was even pre-COVID, and and overall we still have a really good chance to either avoid a recession, which, by the way, is natural to happen. The recession is natural. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the Federal Reserve's fault. But if we don't avoid a recession, if it's short-lived, then I think the Federal Reserve has won and has done exactly what they were supposed to do. So, Phil, I'm going to take it, but I can read in and out of your comments there that you agree with me and Gilstrap <laughs> and their complete condemnation of how the market no. has been handled by the Fed. Do not. Not to this point. I, 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 I do That's not. That's what I heard. I, I, That's I, what I heard. You know, it, I, I didn't hear that, I Phil. they've done as good as they could possibly do to this point. Now, the game's not over yet. The game is still over. We're, we're probably like halfway through the third quarter. The game's not over yet, but I think they're winning that game. I heard. Here's what I like Matt about Canada. Just got appointed to the Federal Reserve. I think that uh, we're Lisa... all in trouble. Then we are all in trouble. I think what's nice about when inflation ultimately has to stop because prices get so high, inflation is the rate of increase. So once we get once the Federal Reserve cost makes everything cost fifty, sixty percent more than it did a few years ago, mm-hmm. then they can declare victory that inflation is over and you can't afford anything anymore, but inflation has gone down. Oh, and by the way, people are unemployed. 
Yeah. Declare victory to, to and go home. Happy. That's right. Financial There's fill. no way, though, to bring, to bring down inflation without increasing rates and without slowing the job market. There's no way that they can do that. And they, and they readily admit that, like, look, if we, if we have to pick one of the two, we're going to say, hey, we're going to injure the job market a little bit, and we're going to have to increase rates and, 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 or let inflation run away. That's what they're left with, and they picked the right one by injuring the job market some, hopefully not too bad, and, uh, and the rates hopefully – will begin to come down sooner rather than later. You know, this is kind of like Christmas vacation. You know, maybe if you wouldn't let the dog eat from the table. You know, Eddie, uh, this is so you know, Maybe if you wouldn't have printed so much damn money and given it away, you know, and wouldn't have this inflation. Hey, uh, Phil, how do we get in touch with you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us within an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue or right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. We appreciate your contributions as always.